Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Therese Butler and I'm the Senior Vice President of our Homeowners Association. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd just like to remind you of two things. First of all, if you haven't already done so, if you would either mute or turn off your cell phones, it would be greatly appreciated. Secondly, I'd like to remind you that as of right now, this presentation not only is li are the live stream viewings available, but just the physical PowerPoint presentation itself will be on our website. And I say that because there is a lot of information we're going to cover. And just so you know, you don't have to scurry to take down notes because you'll be able to go back and look at any one of these slides at any point in time to gather and, and get back that information that you were looking for. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you the individuals who have donated and devoted so much of their time to this effort. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to the Golf Task Force. These members have been together since April of 2016 and have worked tirelessly on the analysis of these two courses. Here with us today are Susan Richards, Manny Medeiros, Rick Cole, Joyce Howard, Byron Cotter, Tim Butler. The two co-chairs of the committee were not able to be here today, and those two members are John Michaels and Mike Brenny. Secondly, I'd like to introduce you to the individuals who be, are part of our Transition Negotiation Committee. And they are Vince Gwizdowski, Bob Kalinda, Mike Collins, Diane Ashby, and myself. When the analysis was completed by the Golf Task Force, we then, the Transition Negotiation Committee, took this information and carried it into golf course negotiations with Saddlebrook Development Company and Saddlebrook Utilities. We're going to now move forward with today's agenda. However, as I just mentioned, when we went forward into negotiations, we did it with two entities, one Saddlebrook Development Company and the other Saddlebrook Utilities Company. And we're making the distinction that it was those two companies and not RCI, the umbrella. Because RCI, the umbrella, Mr. Robeson actually has over 200 companies and corporations. And the negotiations and the purchase agreement, if we get to that point, all the documents are going to refer only to those two entities upon which I just spoke. Now, I might accidentally, later on in the presentation, just because we've always called them RCI, sometimes I accidentally slip back into the other version. So just pretend like you've slapped me and told me, don't do that. All right, we'll move forward with our agenda. Here is what we will cover today. First of all, we'll describe exactly what is for sale. Then we'll describe why to even consider the sale. Third, we'll present the negotiated terms and conditions. And then we'll go over the financials, both historical and a five-year future projection. We will make recommendations. We'll overview the pros and cons. We'll present the timeline for moving forward. And then we'll go into a Q&A session. And I ask that you please hold your questions till we get to the Q&A session. Because as this presentation is, is, continues, you will see that a lot of these, your questions that you may have are going to be answered. For whatever reasons, whether to purchase or not purchase the golf courses is an emotional issue. As we cover the information in today's presentation, I ask that you try to listen with an open mind to everything that's being presented so that you'll have all the information that you need in order to make an informed decision. 
Because remember, the decision as to whether we are going to purchase or not purchase these golf courses is up to each and every one of us. So let's first describe what exactly is for sale. Two golf courses, the Preserve and Mountain View courses, approximately 363 acres of land. Two golf course maintenance facilities. All the golf course maintenance equipment, albeit the majority of it is old and does need to be replaced, but those are included in the five-year financial projections. And all the golf carts. I know there are probably some of you in the audience who are even asking yourself the question, why would we consider purchasing? And I'd like to give you a few reasons why. First of all, to maintain the home values in our community. Secondly, to control 73% of the entire green space in our community. Now, I'm not saying this is 73% of all the acreage in our community, because our homes and buildings make up a much greater portion of that. But what I'm saying is that of all the areas that we term green space, these two golf courses make up approximately 73% of that green space. And another reason to consider the purchase is to maintain the viability of the golf courses as an amenity for marketing Saddlebrook II as a premier active adult community. A little later in the presentation, I'll present information that describes the impacts associated with each of these factors. So another reason, why is this whole thing about green space important? If you recall, in April of 2016, we conducted a survey of our residents in preparation of preparing our strategic plan. We had over 2,800 participants respond to that survey. That's over 54% of our residents. Amazing amount of people to respond. If you're doing surveys, you hope to get between 28 and 32% response rate. And yet we got an incredible 54%. That is... The people who live here, you and I, we care about this community. We care about the direction it's going. And so people want to be able to tell and give their, their ideas on how we should move forward. One of the questions in this survey was related to golf courses. Percentage, 88% thought that the value, the beautiful views, the lifestyle, viability of the golf courses are important to Saddlebrook too. And this is before any of us even realized that they represented approximately 73% of our green space. Excuse me. Carl, it's a little warm in here. I see some people getting uncomfortable. Can you see about raising the uh, temp or lowering the temperature? Thank you. I can see fanning going on. I'm thinking, okay. But mark my words, it's going to get really cold in a few minutes. <laughs> OK. The next portion of the presentation will cover the actual terms of the potential acquisition. Keep in mind, as we move forward, that the Transition Negotiation Committee was looking at the needs of our entire community during the, nor during the negotiations in order to provide value to all of us. As we proceed, it will become clearer what I mean by this. However, if you recall during the last couple of months when we've been trying to give updates on where we are with the Golf Task Force negotiations, we've uh, been telling you that we have to get through the water issue first. We must negotiate a water deal. So the first area we're going to cover in the terms and conditions is the water. So what is the water issue? First of all, water is the second greatest expense in running a golf course. The only expense greater than water 
is labor costs. Excuse me, our labor costs. In case there's any grammar teachers out there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Second, there's two types of affluent. Potable, excuse me, two types of water, potable and affluent. Potable is drinkable. Affluent is treated wastewater that is suitable for golf course irrigation. Saddlebrook Utility Company is the supplier for both types of water for our community. And depending upon where you live in Saddlebrook, you'll recognize Saddlebrook Utility Company under one of its uh, subsidiaries. You either know it as Lago Del Oro Water, Ridgeview Utilities, or Saddlebrook Utilities. Potable water is much more expensive than affluent at the preserve due to additional regulatory fees it incurs. The area known as the preserve, both all the residents and buildings as well as the golf course, falls under the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District, KGERD, which wasn't in effect when the Mountain View Golf Course or any parts of Saddlebrook 1 or the rest of Saddlebrook 2 were developed. Historically, it's been extremely difficult to get affluent water up to the preserve. However, affluent water is the water that it does not face kaggard fees. Affluent water is vital to the economic stability of the preserve golf course. There's a white paper on our website that goes into more detail to provide an explanation of how this district and its regulatory fees play such an important role in the water costs at the preserve. But the bottom line is the preserve needs the affluent water. There is a current pipeline that runs water to the preserve, but it's very small and cannot provide it in sufficient levels. So what's the water solution that we negotiated? Saddlebrook Development and utility companies have agreed to install and pay for a new pipeline to get all possible affluent to the preserve. This pipeline will take them approximately six months to build and will cost them $700,000 to build. They will then own it and maintain it for the life of the preserve golf course. The pipeline will reduce annual water fees by, by excuse me, approximately $150,000 a year now and in even greater amounts in outlying years. If we had not been able to negotiate this deal, we could not have moved forward with negotiations and we would not be here today. This was the crucial linchpin in order to make this a workable offer. One other thing I'd like to point out is, you know, one of the other things we're going to have on our website are the financials that we're going to go into some detail about today. For those of you who like to review financials, what I would say is if you're looking for this $150,000 savings or however you want to term it, do not look for it under the water line item in expenses. Kagerd regulatory fees are paid in arrears of actual water usage. What happens is after the year has been completed, water company figures out how much potable versus affluent water is used. Then KGERD attaches this fee to your property taxes. So for those of you who are going to look further, it's in the property tax line item. So what are the negotiated terms in addition to the water agreement? Well, as we previously said, there are two golf courses involved. There's two golf course maintenance facilities with all their equipment, and there's all golf carts. In addition to this, we have negotiated that you will receive 
the deeds to the existing Ridgeview pickleball courts and the land adjacent to it in order to build six or eight more pickleball courts. Okay. We're also guaranteed 100% of all available effluent water. This means the preserved golf course before Mountain View Golf Course or any other golf course that is serviced by either one by this utility company will get the first shot at how much affluent water that they need. Keep in mind that any of the other golf courses or the lower part of Saddlebrook, we don't incur CAGRD fees. So it makes much more sense to get that affluent up there. And ownership of the golf course, if we choose to purchase, will occur concurrently with transition. In addition to these negotiated terms, RC High has agreed, I should say Mr. Robeson has agreed in writing to not vote his lots for this vote. We knew that he voting these lots was a contentious issue for many of you. The Transition Negotiating Committee was able to convince Mr. Robeson to not vote his lots, his lots in the interests of moving forward. So we'll continue with negotiated terms. Now it's, what is this acquisition going to cost? The price is $2 million, and it's due at transfer of title. The $2 million was a baseline that Mr. Robeson would not budge from. We tried several times. However, based on the realization that $2 million was the number that he was stuck on, the negotiation committee then worked to reduce the impact of this amount by acquiring assets to offset this figure. So, first of all, the pipeline construction at $700,000. We negotiated that RCI would be the ones to pay and install this and not the HOA. Secondly, if we purchase the golf courses, then we have a savings ourselves to ourselves of approximately $250,000 because we won't need to build a new common areas maintenance yard. For those of you that don't know it, we have our common areas maintenance yard currently co-located in the Mountain View Golf Maintenance Yard. However, if we don't purchase the golf courses, Mr. Robeson will sell these golf courses to a third party and we need to vacate that premises because no third party is going to want us in their space. And we will receive the deeded developed land for the Ridgeview Golf Courses and the adjoining area. Should also pointing out that that adjoining area is where we will have to build a common areas maintenance yard if we don't purchase the golf courses, which means we actually would not be able to put any additional pickleball courts there because it's the only viable space we have to do so. Land in our community surrounding area runs about $40,000 an acre if it's undeveloped. The amount of land that we're talking about being deeded to us is approximately four acres. So at $160,000 is very conservative. And I say this because those four acres are actually developed. They're worth more than that because they have all the utilities they have already. So the bottom line, what is the net acquisition cost to the HOA? It's $890,000. Not included in that is the fact that we need to factor in the additional savings of about $150,000 in the regulatory fees that we won't have to pay. I have footnotes on there that try and work the math for you, but I know they're rather small, so I'll just go over them for you. We talk about a $2 million base price for the golf courses. From that, we are saving $700,000 in not having to develop or build, excuse me, the pipeline ourselves. In addition to that, we're receiving $160,000 at least 
that's that's the least value for those four acres of land and if we purchase the golf courses we do not need to put out an immediately an immediate two hundred and fifty thousand dollar outlay for a new common area center so the result is that we acquire two golf courses and this deed of property and all the equipment for a net acquisition cost of $890,000. Each golf course cost six to eight million dollars to be built. So how are we gonna fund the purchase if we so choose to buy the courses? What we intend on doing after much analysis is to borrow $2 million from our own reserve fund to fund the purchase. We're then looking at repaying it over 20 years. The math equates to $100,000 a year to replace it. And the reason we looked at extending it for this length of time is so that ensures future homeowners are also helping to pay for the golf courses and not just those of us who are here today. We asked the Finance Committee to analyze our reserve structure and patterns and compare it to our latest reserve report. They indicate that there will be no period during this next 20 years in which the borrowing of that $2 million will put us in a negative bind. Excuse me. Excuse me. So some of you may be asking yourselves, why would we borrow from ourselves? What I have to say is that our CCNRs, those governing documents upon which we, we rule the association, only allow for very conservative investments, investments on our reserve funds. For example, in 2016, our return on approximately $6 million of funds was $31,000. The best business loan that we could have gotten for the purchase of these golf course or golf courses was from Mr. Robeson himself. He was willing to lend us $1 million at prime plus 1% and carry the loan for five to seven years. That would still have required us to come up with $1 million up front at the, term, at the end of the acquisition. We believe the HOA saves more money by borrowing from itself interest-free than in obtaining a loan from the outside for the purchase. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some additional benefits. And these following benefits, we're calling additional benefits, but we're distinguishing them from negotiated benefits. But they still are additional benefits that would occur. So first of all, the HOA would build a smaller new pro shop, no more than 800 square feet, and replace the existing Mountain View pro shop with this smaller facility. It will cost approximately $150,000 to build, but the funds will come out of our Community Improvement Fund. If you recall, we passed that uh, CCNR change last July and during this time, we have been accruing funds in our Community Improvement Fund. This means that if we build this new pro shop, there is no out-of-pocket expense to any of us. This, then what would we do with the existing pro shop? It will become additional meeting space. Then, the existing Mesquite Fitness Center which was slated in the renovation this summer to be converted to meeting space, will instead be enlarged, have a full floating wooden floor put in, and be available as additional dance space for all of our dancers, as well as provide a banquet room, which would be used for golf course tournaments to increase F&B revenues. The Mesquite building will once again become a lively vital building with marketing appeal what i mean by marketing appeal is that right now when realtors are showing our homes the resales they compete completely bypass the mesquite grill building they don't want to show potential homeowners what it looks like right now or the fact that when you walk in there it is so quiet and feels like a tomb 
going to revitalize that area as well as provide that additional meeting space we need. One of the reasons, or some of the reasons also, that we would make these changes is, of course, to make the golf course operations as efficient as possible. And the current trend in the golf course industry is to downsize pro shops. Not all of them, but many of them. And why would we do that? As Damon Williams, our general manager, says, we cannot compete with Steinmart, with Vans, and with Amazon in providing equipment and merchandise to our golfers. It makes much more sense to have a much smaller space. So why do you think RCI has had, excuse me, Soderbrook Development Companies has had um, uh, such a large space with uh, this much inventory? So let me try to explain to you. What happens if you're a golfer and you either play in tournaments or you play weekly with your, with your men's club or your women's club is when they play their weekly games, they all put two or three dollars into a kitty. And then after the whole round is over and they figure out all the scores and do all the fancy things that get done, there's winnings. So different people who golf that day get winnings. But the winnings, you don't get cash for those winnings. You just get winnings noted. You've got winnings. Maybe you've just gotten $25 of winnings. And right now, the only place you can use those winnings is in the pro shop with merchandise because that Saddlebrook development and all the rest of our HOA is us. If we purchase the golf courses, we don't need to carry inventory because now individuals will be able to use those winnings to buy theater tickets, to buy fitness classes, to get gift cards to use in restaurants. So it's a win-win. The other reason to make these changes is to provide a win-win scenario for all of our homeowners by increasing revenues and by also providing much needed space for socializing. When we did that survey in 2016, that was one of the biggest complaints, is that there's not enough room for everybody to do everything that they want to do. We're going to move forward now and we're going to talk about the financials. And the first financials that we're going to talk about are the historic, excuse me, the historical financials that were provided by RCI. And I can really say RCI instead of SB at this time. Okay, so we've received the annual profit and loss statements from 2011 through 2016. That is six years worth. We received salary information. We received water usage data, as well as access to evaluate the equipment, the structures, the carts, and two golf courses. In our due diligence effort, we hired a company called Borders Management, Borders Golf Management Group. Borders Golf is a consulting firm that evaluates golf courses, and they also own and buy and sell their own golf courses. So Borders Golf Group and their representatives worked with our golf task force to go through the assessment. This slide summarizes the financial impacts of what has occurred at the Mountain View and Preserve golf courses over the last six years. If you take a little bit of time to look at this slide, you'll see that 2014, 2015, and 2016 were not good years. And I'd like to talk a little bit about it. You'll see that the years prior to that was actually a positive uh, revenue structure. I'm going to go over once again the footnotes that might be a little difficult to read. In 2014, up in the preserve, we had very severe, excuse me, severe weather that year. It froze six greens. So unanticipatedly, the preserve golf course needed to close for five and a half months. So that's five and a half months of no revenue because six of those greens needed to be replaced. So then the expenses went up because of that unincurred uh, un unanticipated expense. Now let's move to 2015. In, in 2015, the Mountain View Golf Course was closed for approximately five and a half months. Now this was anticipated. 
but still that is five and a half months upon which you are now not having any revenues come in. And they did this so that they could replace all the greens with a new type of grass, a better grass and one that's more efficient and doesn't need to be overseeded. And they did this as, I would call it step one in trying to prepare the courses as marketable to sell. Then, ah, excuse me. And then in 2016, they had numerous additional expenses, particularly at the preserve, as they then started working on making the preserve, doing the fixes they needed to do in order to also make it a marketable golf course on the open market. In addition to that, the weather at the preserve last September, if you recall, our monsoons went on longer than normal. And September is the month when we do this process on golf courses called overseeding. Unfortunately, due to that extended weather, the preserve golf course had to be overseeded three times. So of that amount that you're looking for there in the negative, you can assume approximately, conservatively, that $90,000 of that was due to the inclement weather. Okay, now we're going to move forward with our future financial projections. And these are projections that we're rolling out for the next five years. However, I want to cover something before we even start to talk about our projections. There is a different philosophy between a developer owning golf courses and a homeowners association owning golf courses. You need to first of all understand that a developer builds and owns golf courses for one reason only. That's to sell us homes. And once he's done that, he doesn't want to own those golf courses anymore. And that's kind of where we are now. However, a homeowners association is owning golf courses for several reasons. But a homeowners association is much more interested in operating them in a fiscally prudent manner. And the following strategies we're going to cover will show a way to recover from the downward trends that you saw under RCI's Saddlebrook Development Company's current management. First of all, marketing. And this is something that is not done for our courses today at all. Second, management strategies. Third, operational expense management. And fourth, water savings. I'd like to spend a little time to review each of the first three strategies in just a little more detail. Since we've already covered water savings, I'm not going to cover that. Excuse me, just a minute. Is it still seem warm in here? Would, would one of you please, uh, Ruslan or Hayden, would you please um, contact either Walter Yazzie or one of our uh, housemen here? It's still warm in here. They need to. They need to reduce the air. Con they need to. Yeah, reduce the air conditioning temperature. Thanks. Well, I I just know because I'm a real cold person and I'm kind of getting warm. So that's and I'm usually freezing up here. So that's why I know it's still a little warm. Okay. So marketing elements. Marketing is our first strategy. What you need to know is that our general manager, along with members of the Golf Task Force and the Transition Negotiation Committee, spent two solid days with Borders Marketing, excuse me, Borders Management Company to develop a comprehensive sound marketing report. And that's also available on our website for your review. So some of the elements of that marketing report are as follows. Create a welcoming professional environment into our golf courses. This is something we're kind of not known for right now. <laughs> Develop a focused professional management team. And where we're going with this is right now the management team that's in place by Saddlebrook Development Company isn't just focusing on our two golf courses. Some of those people are also focusing on Saddlebrook Ranch. And then they're focusing on, on Robeson's community in Eloy. These people are stretched really thin. And we're not getting the attention to detail that we need. 
However, if we own the golf courses, our management team will only be devoted to these two courses. We'd also improve course conditions by providing new equipment and attention to detail. We would keep courses semi-private with residents having priority. And we'd market the Saddlebrook golf experience to our residents and only targeted outside individuals and groups. The report contains numerous options for improving revenue, excuse me, revenues. And those options that we felt that we could work on quickly, the low-hanging fruit that would provide the biggest bang for the buck, we've actually incorporated the financials associated with that in the marketing report. But when you review the report, you'll see that there are a lot of other options available to us. But you can't do them all at the same time. And what the report will also show is there's no, there's no wonder drug. So you have one component that will bring in revenues of approximately 15K a year. Another one's good for 8K. Another one's good for 35K. What's also good about that is while we feel we have strategies that will work, if one doesn't tend to pan out, it's not like you've put all your eggs in one basket and then we'll work on another strategy. So let's focus on our next strategy, the management team. This is the organization chart that Borders and the Golf Task Force and our, manager general, and our general manager, Damon Williams, approved if we purchased the golf courses. What many of you don't realize is such a strong asset for us is that our general manager, Damon Williams, has so much golf course experience. Damon is now in his 22nd year as an active member of the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. Damon spent more than 13 years as a golf course superintendent in the Hilton Head and Myrtle Beach areas of the East Coast. After that stint, Damon then spent greater than three years as a general manager in a much larger HOA than ours that had three 18-hole golf courses. And those golf courses ran revenue neutral or revenue positive the entire time he was managing them. The tremendous asset for us as the HOA is that we have somebody at the helm who truly understands golf and understands the business of golf. Let's talk about our next strategy, and that's expense management strategies. Upon review of the RCI financials with regard to our golf courses, several areas stood out dramatically that could result in immediate impact to expenses. And what I mean by that is once those financials were made available, Borders was looking at them, our finance, group, our finance committee on the, on the golf task force was looking at them, and Damon was looking at them. And you were just seeing a lot of head shaking going on, like, why would they do this? Why would they throw this much seed down? Why would they do this? This is nuts, kinds of things. So they saw immediately ways that we could improve expenses. We could improve procedures for maintaining the courses. We could create efficiencies by cross-utilization of both common area and golf course staff and equipment. A quick example, if you, can, if you need to do something on a golf course, and if you go out there before that course opens, you can get something done very quickly if you have the manpower to do it. As soon as golfers start playing, a task that might have taken 45 minutes to an hour had you sufficient manpower out there is now a three to four hour task. That's a significant amount of labor and lost hours simply because you didn't put out the people you really needed to in the amount. But if we have both components, our, our very own common areas crew that we already have, as well as golf course maintenance staff, you can take care of issues like that. We'd also align with both RCI and Borders Golf for strength of buying power and group discounts. These are group consortiums that they've said that we can participate in with them. 
and we'd modernize the maintenance fleet to reduce maintenance costs and increase efficiencies while improving the golf courses. What we mean there is that a lot of our equipment, almost all of it, is very old. They have mechanics that spend tremendous number of hours keeping that equipment running. In addition, because the equipment is old, it is inefficient. There is golf course equipment out there today that can perform multiple functions at the same time. What this means is that we anticipate a reduction in the labor costs associated with maintaining the golf courses. So the next area is called operating and capital projections as part of our financials. The projections are based on the analysis of six years of the historical data on our golf courses. It's based on the known financial trends for our courses. The impact of Prop 206, the Hourly Hourly Wages Initiative, as a number of common areas maintenance staff fall into this realm. It comes from input from our consultants, both our water attorney and our homeowners association attorney and other government agencies. And these projections will include an inflation factor, excuse me, easy for me to say, right? An inflation factor of 2%. So as I said, the next couple slides, we're going to go over what the operations and capital expenses are projected to be. Before we move forward, though, I just want to do a quick review of the difference between what an operational expense is and what a capital expense is. An operational expense are, operational expenses are those day-to-day and year-to-year -year constant fees or costs that you know are going to always be there for a cost center. And in this instance, the cost center is the golf courses or are the golf courses. However, capital expenses are the monies that you need on a non-annual basis to maintain a cost center, such as equipment or golf carts or irrigation. To use an analogy for your own home, every year on an annual basis, you have to buy food, clothing, utilities, and insurance. However, those things that you tuck away and start to save for are automobiles, appliances, and a new roof. In our HOA, recurring capital expenses are generally funded from our reserve fund. And for those of you that aren't aware, every year as you pay your dues, a portion of your dues are set aside and put over in our reserve fund, similar to what you would call your own money market or savings account. So as we go forward with our projections, the baseline scenario that will be presented is the best estimate of our future financial performance. There are, of course, always significant outcomes that could affect actual financial results positively or negatively, and these include the number of annual memberships sold, changes in the number of employees, and increases and decreases in major expenses associated with a golf course, such as the water, the equipment rental, the seed, the fertilizer. So here is our five-year projection with regard to operations costs. As you can see from this slide, Based upon a solid marketing plan, operation expense strategies, and experienced management and water regulatory fee savings, these, these golf courses can turn around, but it's not going to happen in year one. We see, for the first three years, a gradual in decrease in the amount of expenditures that it, we have to put forward for the golf courses, and then as well as then we start to see revenues increase. We were very conservative for these numbers. Initially, the, we thought that some of the ideas that were in the marketing report, we could institute in year one. However, we chose to take a more conservative approach and say, we believe these are realistic, but we think we need this first year to prove to people that we can make this happen. And also, as our general manager will say, we need that first year in order to turn this course around. It takes a full year of love and tender care in order to get it back to where it should be. So what are some of the key assumptions for these projections? I'm going to leave the slide up here for a little bit and walk through each of the bullets 
so that you have time to digest them. So the first bullet is increase revenue by getting more rounds of golf from Saddlebrook residents. And you say, well, how are we going to do that? I'll tell you, first of all, it's time to bring back disgruntled HOA2 golfers. And those of you that golf know what I mean. Over the last four to five years, over 60, or excuse me, 60 HOA2 golfers have given up their annual memberships with HOA2 and are now playing their golf over at HOA1. That's about $3,200 a, a person. You can multiply that by 60 people and see what that factor is. The reason the majority of them left is because they were so unhappy with the way the courses were being managed and maintained by Saddlebrook Development Company. We have the opportunity and we need to take that opportunity to regain back some of our own golfers. In addition to this, as we mentioned earlier, nobody markets these courses right now. This year we're on track to have well in the neighborhood of 160 to 170 resales on our homes. The people coming in to buy these homes are people who are newly retired. These are people that want to start doing things. And before we get them involved in 20 other clubs, the first thing we're going to try and do is interest them in a little bit of golf. What we can do and what's not done is, once we know, once these people have closed on their homes, our golf course professionals can be talking to those people. We can be offering them incentives. We can be offering them a prorated annual for the rest of their year and even a discount on that. The idea is get them to start playing on our, on our golf courses, make friends with our golfers, and start to really enjoy the game. Secondly, we look at increasing external revenues. As you can see, the amount of money we want to do this or the increases we're looking at are much smaller than what we're trying to do internally. Once again, this would be targeted marketing. This would be our golf professional going and getting tournaments for us to play and then marrying those with banquets associated with the tournaments. One of the beauties of us having two golf courses is that's an, an, an element that we can do without affecting our own residents and their play. In other words, the days you have tournaments on one course, the other course is solely utilized by your residents. Situations such as that. The next area is greens fees increases. The projections call for a 50 cent per round increase each year. The next and a pretty big one is the eliminated amusement tax not due under HOA ownership. Basically right now when uh, a round of golf is sold there's an amusement tax collected. It's analogous to a sales tax. And because Saddlebrook Development Company is a for-profit corporation, they must pay this fee. And it's embedded in the price of your golf round. However, as a nonprofit HOA, we would not have to pay that fee. So that's an automatic capture on, on straight out of about 150 k a year. In addition, we'd see decreased maintenance costs because of more efficient equipment and less labor hours. Conversely, if we're going to market the golf courses, we also have to have and spend some money for marketing. And we're looking at increased labor costs. Now, I just said we're looking at decreased maintenance costs. But while we intend to have less labor on the golf course, the impact of Proposition 206 is incremental and takes in, 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 is factored in over another four years. And that cannot be ignored. And the last area is we'd have increased equipment lease costs compared to how, compared to how our uh, Sauerbrook Development Company does it today. So now we'll move into what we believe are the capital items over the next 25 years. We believe we'll be expending money in in-ground irrigation, in maintenance equipment, in irrigation pumps and controllers, in greens replacement, 
golf carts, bunkers, chemical storage and fuel tanks, and maintenance building upgrades. And that would cost us about, we are approximating a little over $12 million in current dollar value during the next 25 years. So how do you fund those capital investments or capital items? Similar to our reserve fund for the rest of our HOA, we will need to reserve funds for the golf courses. The Golf Task Force recommends funding reserves at $400,000 a year for the first 10 years, but in the first year at $560,000 because of the immediate money that is needed to replace some of that equipment. When you put money into reserves, it provides enough money for big project years without seeking additional funding. Similarly, as you notice, we're starting to do major road replacements in the community. Some of these run half a, uh, half a million dollars a year to a million dollars a year. But yet you don't see us asking for special assessments to pay for it because that's what our reserves do. As I said, the capital equipment has been modeled out for 25 years. So if you go back to review those numbers, you're going to see some numbers are very seem large and some seem very small. That's because during that 25 years, the life cycle on some of those items means it might be replaced more than once. However, there are some line items that will not need replacing during that 25 years. Okay, now, what you've all been waiting for. Drum roll, okay. Financial impact on homeowners. Considering the golf course financial projections and the Homeowners Association's draft five-year financial plan, the financial impact to owners is expected to be the following. In 2018, we will need a one-time only special assessment of $185 per household. That's a one-time assessment, and that is primarily to get the funds we needed to get started, such as our new equipment. The impact on our annual dues beginning in 2018 is that golf, like any of our other amenities, will be included in our HOA operations and its budget. We anticipate that a two, approximately 2.8 amp percent annual dues increase for the next five years, we'll cover everything. That's all of the needs of the association, including golf. Though our five-year plan is still in draft, we're projecting that the average dues increase of 2.8% will cover everything we need. But if you're like me, and math isn't necessarily your forte, what does 2.8% mean? It means that in 2018, and each subsequent year, we look at raising the dues $60. So right now, our dues are $1,980. In 2018, at the most, the dues would be $2,040. In 19, excuse me, 2019, then it would be $2,100. We keep adding $60 through the first five years. So what you can anticipate is that our dues today are $1,980, and in five years, at the most, there'll be $300 more than that. And that's where we believe the stabilization will come. In addition, we believe this is the worst case scenario. And why is that? It's because we have our capital improvement fund. And as this draft five-year plan is being put together, it is not taking any of the monies that we're collecting annually from that capital improvement fund and doing anything with them. We know that at the beginning of each year when we, when we approve a budget, that the board at that time will state for that following year of all that capital improvement fund money that we garner that year, X percent is going to stay in the capital improvement fund for new capital items such as the smaller pro shop. And X percent is going to go into our reserve funds. So every dollar that goes into the reserve funds re re 
reduces by a dollar the amount of money we have to take out of dues. And because this hasn't even been factored into these numbers, it's why we feel very comfortable saying that we believe this is the worst case scenario. I want to make sure everybody understands. Is everybody pretty clear on what we've just covered? And if not, we do have our Q&A session. So what are our recommendations and rationale? The Golf Task Force and the Transition Negotiation Committee recommend to purchase these golf courses. You'll notice, and the reasons for that is, first of all, to protect our home values, to preserve the community and our green space, to eliminate the risks associated with third-party ownership, and to maintain control over a very important amenity. You'll notice that the first bullet up there is to protect home values. And the following slides will show you how golf course ownership can do that. So what are the consequences of a non-purchase? First of all, it's a significant disadvantage to sell real estate without the assurance that the golf courses would always be maintained. In a situation such as ourselves, where there is no assurance of who is going to own these golf courses, how many times the golf courses will change ownership, that is a little unsettling for people looking to move into a community. If everything else is equal, they'll probably move into a community where they know that the golf course ownership is stable and that the golf courses are being taken care of. Third-party ownership could also result in blighted landscape, decreased home values, third-party demand for financial support from the HOA, costly litigation, and dissension among homeowners. As I mentioned, we're going to have a num we do have now a number of documents on our website for you to review. One of those documents is a page that provides links to actual studies and articles that describe actual cases in which these factors have occurred. In addition, we have a number of scanned articles that are available for you to also read that once again go into a description of some of these very scenarios. And so right now what we'd like to do is show you examples of nearby communities in Arizona where some of these factors have become a reality. The first case study is Ahwatukee Lakes, which is located in Phoenix. And that homeowners association has approximately 5,200 homes. In this case, their course closed in 2013. Their developer closed the, closed, excuse me, the course. The golf course is now currently in litigation to change the covenants because the developer now wants to develop that land. It is currently working its way through the Arizona court system, and this summer could very well be at, this, at the Arizona Supreme Court level. And regardless of which way, whether it's a positive or negative outcome for the association, they've now spent tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in costly fees associated with litigation. I'd like to now show you a few pictures of what the course looks like four years after it closed. This is the green space at Ahwatukee Lakes today. This is another picture. You can see the pond in the background. That's no longer a pond. And you can see that hole in the middle of that pond that used to be a beautiful fountain feature. And today, it's just caked mud. The next scenario or subject matter is Kanoa Hills. And Kanoa Hills is located in Green Valley. And that's just so, excuse me, south of, of Tucson. Now, this is an example of, HO, of an HOA that's being held party by a third-party owner of a golf course. And their course closed in 2013. The third party offered to sell the course to the HOA because he wanted out. The HOA refused to purchase the course. So the third party owner turned off the water and walked away. He went into bankruptcy. So here's what Kanoa Hills green space looks like today. In 
And you notice these, of course, are abutting up to homes. These situations show not only what can happen to the green space, but you'll also see what the overgrowth does. So what's the impact of these situations to homeowners who live in golf course communities when these types of things happen? Residents from Ahwatukee Lakes indicate that the homes that are on the golf course declined by 20% in home value, and the homes off the golf course declined by 10% in home value. One of the studies that we have a link to is this 2015 study by the University of Nevada. And it suggests that when a course closes, owners with homes on the golf course lost anywhere from $26 to $32 per square foot. So on a 2,000 square foot home, that's anywhere from a $52,000 to $64,000 loss on your investment. In, a dead, in addition, studies also show that a golf course adds 10% value to homes that are not even on the golf course, but in the community. The average off-course home in Saddlebrook 2 is approximately 2,300 square feet and sells for approximately $300,000. That would result in a 30% loss on your investment if this type of situation were to occur. What I say? No, 10%, 30,000, sorry. I've been doing this for a couple days. It's all starting to run together on me. <laughs> so these are actually true cases of what can happen. So what's your return on investment? What's your ROI on this? First of all, we've talked that we have the potential of going up about $300 over the five years as a potential dues increase. However, if you're just an off the golf course owner with $30,000 loss, it would take you 100, excuse me, 100 years at $300 a year in order to make up for that impact. I know we love to all believe we're young and sprightly. None of us are going to be here for 100 years, though. We're not going to make that money back, OK? Golf course closures have created declining home values in similar communities. Whether the loss in Saddlebrook would be less or more, it's, it's an unknown. We don't know. So what's, let's now look at purchase versus non-purchase. If we purchase the golf courses, we protect homeowner values. We also protect approximately 32% of our green space. What did I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. You guys got to, yeah, okay, I'm, supposed, I'm told to slow down, Therese. But you guys keep keeping me on task here, okay? Thanks. Golf courses are an important amenity of the Saddlebrook experience. What I want to point out is just a few weeks ago in the Arizona Daily Star, there was an advertising supplement dealing with real estate. And there was an article in there, and it talked about how a home buyer goes about selecting the homeowner association community upon which they want to live. Now, we have scanned that article, and it's available for you to look at. And basically, what it was saying is the more amenities that a homeowners association has for you, the greater potential you have of being happy and wanting to settle down there. And in that article, Saddlebrook was specifically mentioned as one of these great communities that has multiple amenities, including golf and pickleball. We'd gain additional pickleball courts. We'd show cross-utilization of golf course lands. In other words, like HOA1, which has their golf course paths open in non-playing hours for walking, we could be doing the same here. Because we'd be marketing, we'd have a greater opportunity to marry golf course tournaments with banquets and thereby, thereby increase F&B banquet revenue. Once again, smaller pro shop, more meeting space, more dance floor space. We control our destiny. And you would have a golf course one-time assessment 
of $185. What happens with a non-purchase? Potential, not saying it will happen, but potential loss of property values of at least 10 to 20 percent. We'd lose control. There would be an immediate $250,000 outlay to build the new common areas maintenance yard, which of course would go in the area where we were going to put the new pickleball courts. We'd have decreased marketability of the community, where I mentioned earlier that people want to know for sure that if they're living in a golf course community, they want to know who's going to take care of it. Our biggest competitor right now for selling homes is four miles up the road, and it's called Saddlebrook Ranch. And I can guarantee you that for the next 15 to 20 years, the people that are buying there know exactly who's going to control those golf courses. That's a significant that advantage they have over us. Potential ransom by third-party owner. If you go to our website, we also have either articles or links to articles Scanned articles, Line Country Club, which is here in Tucson. Those articles point out that the third party owner of the golf course said, if you, HOA, want these golf courses to stay green, you will now have to pay me X number of dollars a year in order for me to keep them green. If we don't buy them, RCI maintains control until they sell them. There's no cross-utilization, and if a third party buys them, there's also no cross-utilization. One of the other things I also want to point out about a third party owner, even if this person or company would keep up the golf courses, there's no guarantee they'd stay semi-private. They're going to be looking for revenue, and they're going to go wherever they can to get it. This thought I pointed out. So we believe the golf courses are a win-win for our entire community. So what happens now? This presentation and live streaming and numerous documents relating to the golf courses are now available on our website. These include the borders reports, the golf course evaluations on both of the golf courses. It includes the marketing report. It includes by line item, the five-year projection financials. What you saw was an overview. If you want to bury yourself into it, you can actually go through line item by line item. As I mentioned earlier, there's a white paper on the water issue. There's a letter of intent. The letter of intent was what we needed to get signatures on by both us and Mr. Robeson, Saddlebrook Development Company, in order to be able to present you this information today. It is the basis that if you as homeowners say, yes, let's purchase these golf courses, that forms the basis for the actual legal documents that will be put together by our attorneys and their attorneys that take the factors in the letter of intent and make them something we can sign. If today you don't get your questions answered, or if after you look at the additional documentation you have additional questions, all you have to do is email them to this email address, gtf at saddlebrook2.com. Those will then get passed on to the subject matter expert in that area, and you will get a personal response back. In addition, those questions that are asked frequently will go into an FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions document, that will also be on the website for you to review. In addition, you can also use that same email address because members of the task force and the negotiation committee are available to address you at unit meetings or club functions. And even if your unit doesn't normally hold unit meetings, but you want to ask your unit rep to hold one for more information, we'd be happy to come. However, if after all of this, you still have questions, we're going to take care of you. We are looking at having two more town halls. We will not be presenting this presentation. What we will be doing is going over the FAQs, the frequently asked questions that are coming forward. We'll also be listening to feedback and providing information related to the feedback. 
Those two presentations will be held on Monday the 26th at 1 p.m. and Tuesday the 27th at 9 a.m. We will be issuing tickets for those similar to this just to ensure that we don't exceed our uh, fire capacity limit. And those tickets will be available early next week and we'll do another email blast when they're available. Doing two of these town halls because we think that for the most part you guys are going to get your questions answered. However, if we do see those fill up, we will go ahead and offer more sessions. Let's review the voting process. There will be one vote per household in good standing. The ballots will be mailed today. The voting packet that you'll receive will include instructions, the actual ballot, a copy of the letter of intent, and a return envelope. And the return envelope, similar to all of our other elections, will request your unit and lot number as well as your signature. However, if you are traveling and you are unable to get your ballot through the mail, we will have them on our website available on Monday the 19th. Or if you're having trouble accessing it through the website, just email Diane Flores and she will email you back a budget. A ballot. <laughs> I wasn't doing this the last three presentations, honest. I think I'm just getting a little tired. However, I ask that you utilize this avenue as only a last ditch effort. And the reason being, while we can send you the ballot and instructions, we can't send you that envelope that reminds you to sign it and put your unit and lot number on it. Because if your ballot comes back and we don't have that on your envelope, we cannot count your ballot. We cannot, your vote won't count. So please only use this if there's no other possible way for you to get your ballot. Ballots will then be able to be deposited in the voting box in the Mountain View Clubhouse entryway. And they must be deposited by 4 p.m. on July 21st. So we're offering a real healthy month in order upon which you can make your decision and post your ballot. For those ballots that are mailed in, they must be postmarked by July 21st and received by July 28th. The ballots will be counted and the results announced on Monday, July 31st. And the decision will be based on 50% plus one of the votes received. As a reminder, Mr. Robeson will not be voting his lots in this election. And I need to emphasize one other thing. This is our only vote. If it's yes, we move forward. If it's no, there's no round two. There's no more negotiations. He will put it on the market to a third party. And if it's no, then we simply move out of a purchase agreement on the golf courses and your negotiating team is now there to negotiate transition. So in conclusion, in April of 2016, your fellow residents in the golf task force undertook a monumental effort to research, analyze, and debate the financial impact of owning the preserve and Mountain View golf courses. In December of 2016, you elected the Transition Negotiation Committee to carry the HOA interest into negotiations with Saddlebrook Development Company. <laughs> the result of the tireless combined efforts of both groups is the letter of intent, which outlines the key terms and conditions which we've just gone over today. The golf courses are an integral part of our community, whether you play golf or just enjoy their views. The Golf Task Force and the Transition Negotiation Committee are fully supportive of the acquisition of these golf courses. Let's stay in control of our destiny and vote for the purchase of these golf courses. Thank you.
So now we'll be opening up the floor for questions. We have microphones available on each side of the auditorium. We ask that if you have a question or multiple questions, you ask one question and then, not that we won't answer multiple questions, but we need to ask you to go to the back of the line and come forward again for your next question. When you ask your question, we ask that you please state your name and unit lot number. And there is a time limit of two minutes per question. I would uh, caution the team up here that, so that we don't get chastised again that you're a little more eloquent in your briefings about yourselves. What I'm asking to happen before we start actually taking questions is each member of the task force and negotiation committee are going to introduce themselves. They're going to tell you a little bit about what their efforts are in this whole effort and what their experience is that has brought them to be here today. And the reason we're doing this is because you need to understand the immense brain trust that is on this stage that have worked so hard to get to this point. So with that, if you guys would please. Uh, my name is Bob Kalinda. I live in Unit 47. My involvement with uh, this endeavor has been uh, learning everything I can from the gentleman to my left about water, water issues, uh, golf course and water issues, and all the regulatory agencies in Arizona that kind of rule over every aspect of water. Uh, I've also been a member of the strategic plan here in the HOA, and in my professional life, I negotiated many, many labor contracts. Hi, I'm Rick Cole. I'm a member of the uh, Golf Task Force, and I worked on water and financials here. In my prior life, I worked for General Mills for 36 years out of Minneapolis. My name is John Michaels. Um, I'm on the Greens Committee, and, and uh, I've been on that most of my existence here in Saddlebrook, which has been over, over 13 years now. And uh, on the Golf Task Force, and in my prior life, I was a teacher, teacher, excuse me, that's the Viking and working on my, okay, and I, I don't mean, I don't, I don't belittle the thing, but I couldn't come this morning because I was in such pain, thank you. Okay, I want you to know I'm sober. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Susan Richards, I'm on the uh, golf task force. Uh, in my prior life, uh, I was a certified financial planner, business owner, college teacher, you know, this kind of thing. I worked on uh, communications and home values. My name is Manny Maduris, Unit 36, and I'll have what John's having. <laughs> um, I'm. <laughs> yeah, where am I? Who am I? <laughs> In my prior life, I negotiated labor agreements with Pacific Gas and Electric Company and Duke Power, and I was a director of safety and health for 850,000 people in Canada and the United States. Um, here, it's a little easier. I'm on the operating committee, and we look at the equipment and how to grow grass and hopefully keep them from killing it any more than they do time, from time to time. Thank you, Manny. My name is Tim Butler. I live in Unit 47. Uh, I'm on the Golf Task Force, uh, along with Manny on the operations uh, subgroup. Uh, my background, it, my educational background is in uh, plant sciences, and my career was in agricultural pest management. Hi, Diane Ashby, Unit 36 here in Saddlebrook. I worked on the Transition Planning Committee, the Strategic Planning Team, and now on the Transition Negotiating Committee. In my past life, I was a university professor and vice president for finance and planning and a vice president for university advancement, uh, focusing especially on administration and planning. Um, here today, I'm focusing mostly on home values. Uh, I'm Byron Cotter. Um, I'm on the uh, golf task force on the financial analysis end. Uh, my background's a little bit different from a lot of the others here. I have a PhD in chemistry, which along with two and a half bucks will now buy me a cup of coffee up at the bistro. I also have a master's in business administration, which I got at uh, SUNY at Buffalo by going to night school for four years. Um, I spent a good 30 years of my career figuring out how to fiddle budgets to my advantage, uh, 
I spent a lot of my career working with the numbers, so I'm, and I also had an accounting group appointing, uh, reporting to me for a while, so that's how I ended up with the financial analysis end of this thing. He uh, should have added he's also a non-golfer. And I'm also a non-golfer, just to make sure you know that we have some non-golfers up here. Uh, my name is Vince Gwizdowski. I'm your uh, HOA to vice president and treasurer. And prior to that, I was on the finance committee for almost four years before taking on this new role. I was also on the strategic task force for the entire time period. My former life was primarily uh, in the Army and a corporate executive. And I did mergers and acquisitions internationally and domestically. I'm formally trained in strategy development and negotiations. And I, did, I was a lead negotiator, lead negotiator on contracts ranging from $1 million to $1.2 billion. That was for Northrop Grumman. Uh, my name is Joyce Howard. I live in Unit 48. I'm also on the Golf Task Force, and I've worked on the finance area, which is my background. I am a CPA. I started my career in auditing. I ended it at Northrop Grumman as assistant controller, and I was responsible for financial planning and financial reporting. I didn't know it, but I was reporting to Joyce at the time. <laughs> I'm Mike Collins. I'm in Unit 17. Um, I'm on the Transition Negotiating Committee. I was also involved in the Transition Committee that led towards transition. I have an MBA. I worked in a variety of uh, financial positions and corporations over 20 years. And um, I guess that's about it. You've also been on the Finance Committee for a lot of years. Forever. For light years, I think. Six, Six years. Okay, with that, we'll now open it up. Oh, you guys, you're making this easy. Microphones on each side of the yeah, room. Yeah, we have microphones on each side, and we'll just go back and forth. So, you're, yeah, just lean it down. That'll work for you. Okay. Um, Rose Storlack, uh, Unit 49, Lot 21. And can the Mountain View Golf Course only be used as a golf course? Um, the Mountain View Golf Course at this time can only be used as a golf course. And what do you mean by this time? Well, because the, if there's a change of ownership, somebody might try to attempt to change something. But quite frankly, they cannot do that. Uh, in the Pinal County, we have a, a covenant, a restricted covenant, that ensures that the golf course will remain as a golf course. How so they won't be able to change it. How about the preserve? Preserve is uh, zoned as a golf course, and it is platted. This side. Uh, Ron Bechke, Unit uh, 42. Um, my uh, first item is the, um, the siding that you used for possible disadvantages of third-party ownership. Uh, the Kanoa Hills Golf Course um, was never part of the association, was always owned by third parties. It, was, it did go into bankruptcy and is now open. Okay, it's owned by another company, and it's only open. only one of them is open. No, there no. was two courses. There are two courses. The Kanoa Hills Golf Course is the second one, which just opened. Uh, Awatuki, I'm not 100 percent certain uh, because uh, you used the name Awatuki Lakes, and when I looked things up, they had Awatuki Golf Course, which had come out of bankruptcy and is now open. And if you look at the pictures there of that golf course, um, it looks just like the preserve as far as I can tell. They're just pictures. Uh, next, the, um, the most important thing, neither of those uh, golf courses had the provision that we have in our CC&Rs, uh, which restricts the, the, the owner of the golf course to maintaining the quality of the golf course. A better example is uh, the um, um, Skyline golf course, um, which did have that um, uh, item requiring the developer to keep it at maintaining it, and he did. Um, and uh, when he no longer could afford to do it, I think because of bank loans, uh, he did go to the homeowners, uh, and the homeowners got the golf course, the fitness center, the tennis courts, uh, the uh, restaurants, etc. Uh, and they did pay extra. They do have to pay extra in the contract. 
It's about $1,000 a year. But most of that goes for non-golf things. So the question is, why would we have to buy a golf course in order to maintain values when it's pretty obvious that they will maintain values? Uh, I guess nobody else wants to answer it, so I will. Um, why do we buy a golf course? Well, we have those studies, and you're going to be able to see those studies, especially from the University of Nevada, that talks about a minimum of 10 to 20 percent. We actually have read articles of other golf courses around the nation that homeowner values on the golf course have been as bad as 20 percent loss in value, and, oh, sorry, 25, 35 percent loss in value and off the golf course up to 20%. That seems to be the current trend when you lose control of, of the golf course, either because of mismanagement or third party management. So we do not run, we, we've done enough analysis that we do not buy what you're saying. We actually believe in what we've done and we're giving you the proof. You'll be able to take a look at it when it's all, in fact, it probably should be online right about now. Uh, and then and then take a hard look at it and give us those questions on the GTF and we'll be happy to answer them. But I'm sure some of my colleagues have a couple other comments. Um, just working out. A couple, a couple of items on these golf courses. Uh, the Ahwatuiki Lakes course is still under litigation. It is not reopened. If I remember correctly, I was part of the group that drove up there. And if I remember, there's also a separate Ahwatuiki golf course, not Ahwatuiki Lakes. Uh, if you talk about the uh, Kanoa Hills, there's actually three golf courses that are under new ownership. There's, there's a, they changed the name to, uh, from Kanoa Hills to San Ignacio. And there's a San Ignacio North and a San, San Ignacio South, I believe, or, or another name. They've reopened two of the courses, but they have not reopened. Uh, San Ignacio North, I believe it is, which is the Okanoa Hills. And I was in the uh, Green Valley uh, newspaper just, just two days ago looking for the current status. And that appears to be the current status of those golf courses. Sir. Uh, yes, I'm Jack Jackson, Unit 23. I am a golfer, using the term quite loosely. My <laughs> My question has to do with water. It's my understanding that the Saddlebrook Utility Agreement will result in them sending all available, available effluent to the preserve. If this is correct, my question is, what if we receive more than we really need? What do we do with the excess? Jack, I saw your email and I was going to answer you this afternoon. Um, right now on the affluent, the preserve has the right to take what they need. If the, if, the, if the utility produces more, which they will in the winter, than we can use, that can also go to Saddlebrook One and to Mountain View. Um, we wrote the agreement so that we can get all the water we need in most months, like April through um, probably September, October. And unfortunately, that's the time they produce the least amount of production. <laughs> so we, we, we will not be able to get all the affluent we need at that time. That's why we're gonna have a new motto here in the summertime, flush twice, the preserve <laughs> needs the water. <laughs> As far as, okay. I'll, I'll as far now as, as uh, what will happen um, when they produce more affluent than all the golf courses need, uh, in, in the uh, purchase agreement, we will not have to pay for it, but we don't have an agreement whether we have to take it or not, and that will be negotiated in the purchase agreement. Well, I appreciate that answer because, as you well know, during the winter, when the preserve needs less water, it turns into a rice paddy out there just because they're dumping it all. 
That's right, and people don't even need to flush twice during the winter months. <laughs> but uh, uh, when you review that letter of intent, you will see that there is a section when we're talking about water and our ability to have as much as we need. We also covered that area, the fact that they, the produce, the effluent that is produced, they cannot, the utility company, just run it down stream. They have to get rid of it in the communities. So that's why sometimes there's more watering than you think needs to be done. But what we have negotiated is that even when you need to get rid of that extra affluent, we don't get charged for it just because we, because if we don't need it. I do want to commend all of you for the last year that you've spent on your lives doing all this. And Teresa, I hope you don't wake up in the middle of the night redoing this presentation. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> this side. Hi, my name is Mary Barrios. I'm in Unit 49, Lot 25. And my question is regarding the annual dues. I understand that you anticipate they would go up $60 over the next five years. And I'm assuming that's only for the golf course part. Aren't there other reasons that it could go up? Or is that just the maximum it will go up with everything? No, um, they will, they're not firm yet because it's part of the five-year plan, which needs to be approved by the board. And the, the approximate increase would be $60 per year, every year for, for, the, for the five years. That is an all-inclusive price. So we absorb all the amenities that's for the full operation of the HOA and to successfully, and finance, to successfully fund the reserves to an adequate nature so we are not going to be in any kind of financial distress. Thank you. This side, please. Sir? My name is Bob Wall. I'm in Unit 36. I, have, I could probably look this up. I don't want to bore you this question, but just, what's the profit status of Saddlebrook One Golf Course? Because it's right here. It's very similar to ours. What is their revenue status, profit, Saddlebrook One Golf Course? The uh, golf course has a positive cash flow of around $200,000 a year. I've seen the projection in the future. It stays about the same. What would it be if you took away all the hard money for golfers? They stole things. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very but, much. You've answered my question. Yeah. I said, what I said was, it was said earlier that uh, Rotten Old Saddlebrook One had taken 40% of our golfers or something, and I said, what would they be? No, 60 doing? golfers. 60 what will happen to them when we get our golfers back? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sir? Hi. Um, Jim Frager. Uh, yeah, can I, can I, can I, what happens? We would love to see that $180,000 revenue come back to our golf courses, okay? Okay. Jim Frager, Unit 46. I just have a quick question on the math. My understanding is that the purchase price is $2 million, um, and yet you're indicating that we're going to have a $700,000 savings by not having to be pay for the installation of the infrastructure to pipe the water up to preserve. But that's not a savings. We're still paying $2 million. But you identified our final price is 800 and some odd thousand. So explain how that's a savings. It's not. It's an offset. But, but there's a but difference. It doesn't between, change the purchase price. Well, no, it won't change the purchase price because the purchase price was uh, about as concrete as we were going to get as an answer. So the, the the strategy behind it was to zero balance as much as we could from the purchase price to offset it with getting assets or assurances of promises to build other things that we would have had normally probably had to pay for. For instance, the negotiation that Trees talked about on the pipeline itself was touch and go. They wanted us to pay for it. To, they wanted that to be part of the uh, the entire package. So we negotiated that out. So in effect, that took away $700,000 of cost to us. But so it the balance been, sheet started to balance a little bit. Okay, so but the price would have been $2,700,000 if we had paid for it. Uh, if we were bad negotiators, it'd be a lot higher than that. Okay. In addition to that, that pipeline is a gift that keeps on giving because you have annual savings of at least 150,000. The CAGARD fees go up every year. And as long as we can keep that golf course watered with affluent, then we drastically reduce the CAGARD fees. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got the benefits. Okay. It's just the characterization. 
that I don't think is how you want to present it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Seid, please. My name is Tom Ambler, Unit 32, Lot 78. I have a question. It seems that what I've heard today is favorable toward purchasing the golf course. What about third-party companies that own and operate golf courses throughout the country that are successful? I haven't heard anything about that today. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we haven't surveyed. Uh, successful third-party owners of golf courses and HOAs. I mean, there are golf courses that are profitable. Uh, I think Damon could comment much better on those that are. He's got much more experience in the field. But I will say this. If, if a third party buys this golf course, uh, you, you have to ask the question. They'll, they'll only buy it if they think they can get a positive cash flow out of it. And there's, there's several ways they can get a positive cash flow potentially out of it. Uh, first of all, they don't put any money into it. They just collect the revenues and minimize their expenses. They can probably save on some of their expenses. For example, labor, if we, if we own the golf course, we pay benefits to people working for us. If they own the golf courses, they probably don't pay any benefits. So, uh, also, they would not have any capital investment if they're trying to milk it for cash. So, so that's a risk factor that somebody comes in, buys the course, milks it for cash, and then gets out, just walks away. Another risk is that uh, they come in, they milk it for as much cash as they can, they run into a big capital investment, then they come to us and say, oh, by the way, we need a couple million dollars or we'll shut the course down. So it's third-party ownership is a risk for us. It's not necessarily something we can say would be a disaster, but there is a lot of potential for disaster if there is third party ownership. Okay, I'm not certain, but did you also ask about if we owned it but had a third party manage it? Was that your? Well, like a true. Basically, my question is there are companies in this country that own and operate golf courses for uh, uh, homeowners oh. like ourselves. Are th what have we done to look at ones that are successful? Is your, is your, I think your question is, are we going to get any outside party to run our golf course if we purchase it? No, that's no? not what he's asking. Okay. Uh, I'll try to chime in here. I've been in the business 23 years, the golf business. The, the few scenarios where you have companies that own and operate golf courses are normally real estate investment trust where they are not interested in profits. And don't don't think that they're making profits. They invest in them because the land uh, golf courses are technically built on the fringes of metropolitan areas. As metropolitan areas grow, that land turns into apartment complexes. The golf courses tend to start going away. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Carol Poole, Unit Fifteen, and Lot One Two Three. Could you uh, get a little closer? Sorry. Thanks. Okay, thought I was close enough. Um, my question goes back to what the previous gentleman said about the presentation of the cost of purchase, because the cost is $2 million, and the $700,000 that was presented as an offset, my question is, if we didn't purchase the golf course, would we have to pay $700,000 for that pipe, for that pipeline? No. Well, then how is that an offset? <laughs> How is that an offset? It would be an offset if we purchase it. If we don't purchase it, well, whoever comes in is either going to have to negotiate with, uh, uh, who are we calling it now, RCI? Yeah, but it's, it's uh, I think, an incorrect representation of the cost to say that the cost is $2 million, but we're going to save $700,000, and we're going to save X amount of dollars per year in water when we would not incur those costs at all if we did not own the golf courses. Well, that's a fair representation, but we're actually advocating purchasing them, so we're trying to, as I said before, maybe the, maybe offset's the wrong word. What word would you use? Whatever word you use, it shouldn't be in the equation. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. This side, please. Okay, I'm not too sure which one to ask first. Um, again, road store like you know, 49, lot 21. Sorry, sorry. Um, 
if we do purchase these uh, golf courses and it costs more to maintain them than is projected, then who pays for that increased cost? Is it just going to be cost go on to the golfers or the whole community? Um, Joyce, would you go over your, uh, your stress tests on the uh, baseline financials, please? Sure. Um, what we projected here today was our baseline uh, financials, which we think is the best estimate. But we did look at potential upside and potential downside. So obviously things will happen, good or bad, that you, you just don't know when you're putting together a plan. So we looked at things like, well, what if we sold more annual uh, play cards? What if we um, sold fewer? What if water was more? What if it took more people or less people to maintain the golf course? And we came up with a range of uh, about $200,000 annually up or down uh, that, that could occur. And if that happened, that would be about a $70 per household cost. It could be better, it could be worse. Yes. So we might get a refund. <laughs> <laughs> that would be up to the board at that time. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Dick Helms, Unit 31, Lot 56. Uh, you said Robeson wouldn't budge on a $2 million asking price. Um, so that raises the question in my mind, what do we know about his ability or likelihood of getting that amount or any other amount for these golf courses from someone else? And perhaps a related question that gets to Robeson's motivation. Why is he treating HOA 2 worse than HOA 1? Because it's my understanding maybe not true, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that he gave the golf courses to HOA 1. Okay, that, that's kind of a urban legend. And um, Vince, will, Vince will take the call on that one. What was the first, question part, first part? Which part am I answering? <laughs> About whether, why, is RC, why was uh, Mr. Robeson so adamant on two million and could he get more, is um, it more or less? We had, a, we had the Borders Management Consulting Group come in, and they did, they're a nationally known group, and they did a series of surveys. They buy and sell golf courses around the United States. And the, the final figure that they came in with, uh, an estimate, of course, because they are consultants and they're probably within plus or minus 5%, was these golf courses could be sold for $2.679 million. And um, that will be online, and you can read that entire report. Uh, and you can make it, you can pass your own judgment. But this is why we hired the, the experts out there that knew far more uh, about the national trends than we knew here locally. Um, he was very adamant about freezing the $2 million and made it perfectly clear to us, if you don't buy it, someone else will, and I'm going to get $2 million or better. So we tried four times, at least four times, to, to change that, uh, to, to obviously to get the, the price lower. But at that point, we knew we had to negotiate other ways to uh, get a better deal out of, uh, out of the Robeson community. OK, Vince, we're also going to cover, whether you are or Mike, um, the fact that the perception is that those golf courses were free to HOA1. Sure. Prior to transition, which uh, was in 1999, um, there was an assessment made against all the lots uh, in HOA 1 to the tune of $4,000. Yes. You want, Ron, I'm not going to argue with you. I've got the documentation. Done. $4,000. At the time of transition, there was no declared value for anything. All the assets were turned over to the homeowners. Post-transition, um, uh, post there have been assessments of a total of uh, $3.3 .3 million over 10 years, 10 years really pretty much right after uh, the transition. One million of that was, well, one thousand of that, excuse me, was for their clubhouse. So 2.3 million was for other items within their budget. So they've had about $7,000 of assessments since inception. Um, for those of you who are skeptical about that $4,000 um, assessment on each home, 
Um, you can talk to Vince afterwards. He has the actual document. Um, this side, please. Mark Schwartz, Unit 23, Lot 19. Uh, one of your slides indicated that you've identified critical people like Mr. Damon Williams for going forward if we own and operate the golf courses. Um, has Have you developed a plan to make sure we retain critical people in these spots, which will give us the management uh, skills you called out? You. Yes, the way these acquisitions take place basically is um, on the day of the actual transaction, signing day, so to speak, there'll basically be two tables set up somewhere in one of our rooms. RCI will cut ties with all their current employees, every single one of them. They have to have a clean break. They'll pay them up on their vacation due, sit time due, all of that stuff. They'll come to the next table, and they will have already been re-interviewed. And then we will sit there individually with each person and either offer them a job or not offer them a job at that point. Well, the question also includes yourself. Do we have Mr. Williams and some of our critical leaders signed up for all or most of this five-year period? You need to talk to the board about that. <laughs> it, it, is, it is standard in this industry for general managers, especially golf course superintendents and general managers to sign, you know, two to three-year contracts at a time. That is pretty standard, yes. Under our current uh, management fees are in the way that, um, in fact, RCI just runs it. Um, they will not allow us to write con long-term contracts. I would, I'd like when to, we transition, we may be able to do that. I'm like old to, school. I like, like to see like a ball to, and chain on somebody. Uh, hold on. Let me let me go into something because this was a negotiating point about the HR side of this on the employees, and I want to follow up. You all have access to the letter of intent. It will be online. It will be in your ballots. But I'm going to read to you paragraph six of the employees. It's very short. On closing date, declarant will satisfy Robeson will satisfy all obligations and liabilities related to the employees who work at the golf courses, including without limitation, all payroll, vacation, sick leave, retirement plans, and insurance matters. We're not going to. We're not. We are not going to inherit any liabilities. What that line says. Following execution of the purchase agreement, the association, us, may interview such employees to consider hiring some or all of them, which is what Damon went, uh, went in, into detail on. We did not want to get stuck with um, a, a liability issue with the employees coming over to our side. Okay. Thank and you. Um, just to clear any confusion, upon execution of the purchase agreement, that is the earlier date than closing on it. So in other words, we should have a couple months, couple months between the time that the purchase agreement has been executed upon which we would actually take ownership. So that will give Damon and his crew time to interview the people, decide who it is that they think is strong and who they'd like to have continue to work for us, but also go on a search for other positions that they want to fill outside. Thank you. Over here, sir. Yes, my uh, name is Reese Jadlin, Unit 17. And the question I have is, uh, what is our annual membership right now? Our annual dues? Excuse me? Our annual dues or our annual membership? For, for well, you the mean the amount of homes? Well, how about both? That's the whole thing. The cost of a membership plus the number of members we have. Okay, our um, annual dues right now are $1,980. That's what they were in 2017. Uh, that I think he's talking about the golf dues. I think the question is golf related in terms of annual dues cost. Is annual, that correct? What did you say? Say it again. Are you referring to yeah, the we, annual? How many members do we have presently? And what does this cost for membership? Golf members that yes. receive annual dues. Is that what you're asking? Yes, correct. Annual golf memberships and, and what the rates are. That's where the bulk of the revenue okay. is going to come from, isn't it? The the I can address what the what the the annual fee is if to be a golf member to purchase an annual pass, and that would be uh, thirty four hundred and fifty dollars currently. Um, I don't recall right now how many annual members we have. Rick, do you remember? Uh, the last two years we've had approximately three hundred and fifty annual memberships, but we also sell, sell play cards, 
We, we sell different numbers of play cards. Sure. We sell yeah, nine hole play cards. You'll have for one, one course or both courses too, right? Correct. And we also have daily fees. And how many does one have? Um, Guess I, I do not know. I've been told okay. approximately 400. Okay. Thank right. you. Oh, one other question. Uh, actually. Well, just a quickie. What happened? What's Oro Valley's problem? Um, that I will let uh, Mr. Williams, Damon Williams, he uh, lives on that golf course in Oro Valley, and he can address it for you. Does anybody want a good home in Oro Valley before they turn the water off? That's my first question. No, the um, – I don't know what will happen to Oro Valley. They have three different consulting firms working together this summer to make a recommendation to city council as to what they think those 45 holes of golf in that community center should be used for going forward. Um, personally, I live on two golf holes. I hope they don't turn the water off. Of course, um, if you well, I, I, I'm in one of the only sections of all of Kenyatta Hills that those 36 holes run through that could actually be developed because I overlook two golf holes, and we have 800 foot of road frontage on the Ronha. The rest of that entire community of Kenyatta Hills, all those sub-associations are private streets. They have no access to that golf course land to develop that land into homes. Yeah, because their numbers get to be pretty bad, as you know, okay. what they've talked about. Well, a lot, of that is, a lot of that is the management company actually doing capital improvements that the council has, has allowed them to do. So that isn't really operational loss in total. They are losing a little money, but they're losing more money from the last meeting I went to with city council actually on the community center than they are the golf course. Because yeah, they had a real there, they had a, they had a okay. Thank you. Sales tax. Thank you. Um, sure. this side, please. Hi, Denise Anthony, unit 49, lot 32. And first of all, I think that a tremendous amount of work and expertise is being laid out for us to look at, and I really appreciate that. My fear is. <laughs> my fear is that it's June and the vote is in July. And it's going to be 115 plus a lot of people have already left. I, I fear that if we're only allowed to have one vote, that um, we aren't displaying the expertise and the work to the full community. And I know you're putting it on the website. And I know you're, that if people signed up to forward their mail, ballots will be forwarded. But I just feel that the community as a group is not here right now. And that whether this passes or it doesn't, we will always have a, a history of I wasn't there when they presented it. I wasn't there when they voted. So that the timing is my concern because the work has been done. It needs to be valued. And my concern is, is the time frame. Um, I did have problems in the beginning when I started my other life. At one time is when we had 22,000 employees spread over California from the Oregon border down to the county of Los Angeles. Also, I was a member, I was on an HOA board and we had the same problem. And I paid dues to California to another HOA. And the problem of mailing is always difficult, but everybody has time. In fact, under the Labor Relations Board would take this committee's recommendation on how they're doing this and be flabbergasted by it because it's far more than the law allows or, or requires. Um, it, you may have people coming saying, well, I wasn't there, but the, we're doing everything possible. We've gone beyond possible, in fact, in my opinion, on getting the information to people, meeting with people, I have people calling me from out of town, one as far as Alaska, and ask me certain questions, and that's fine. So people are getting some information. As far as, you gotta realize there was another little thing called Robeson that got involved in all this. We started April 6, uh, 19, uh, 2016 bargaining, and then at that time in October, I made a passing remark to Bill Eichner to, we're ready. I think we're ready to do this. And that's when we had one course, Mountain View, to do. Next thing I know, now we got two courses, and we're starting over again, doing our due diligence on another course. That got stopped. Well, we got through that, and then the board 
came on and they late they were not elected by the membership here in what December and they be and that negotiating committee came in we had to bring them up to date and give them the material that we already done and they've done a fine job with it but Robeson was gone the key one of the key negotiators was gone from time to time we got delayed by another I don't know three three weeks or a good four weeks in that round of bargaining and that delayed and that because we were concerned about people getting out of town and that's why we met started meeting a year ago eight, six, April 16th and so what they've done as far as this whole process going is do everything they can I don't know what else you can do and if we don't do it on a timely manner then somebody's going to say, hey, are you going to buy these golf courses or not? Uh, Denise, um, as Manny said, I, we all shared your concern, but I do have some statistics about reaching out and getting the message out there. We've had approximately 1,200 people in attendance here over four meetings. We've had over 500 people online, live, looking at this from all over the world. I literally got an email a text message from Paris, France. Unbelievable. Great. We actually understood everything and saw it. We're reaching out and we're touching them. The ballots are will be online uh, at the SBH, SBA, uh, the RHOA2 uh, website. For those that really are going to be away, Diane Flores will, can take an email and she'll supply that. We're doing everything we can to keep this moving. And quite frankly, if it stalls or dies out, it affects transition, it affects, it just affects everything. So unfortunately, we didn't plan to do it this summer. <laughs> uh, we really wanted to get this accomplished much, much faster, but it has been a huge effort to get the word out and to make sure everybody has access to the information and, and to make sure that you will have uh, enough information to make a excellent decision, which our decision, our, our recommendation is we purchase. Sir. Hi, my name is Tina DeBacco, Unit 24. First of all, I want to thank everyone up there for their service. And I think you did a very astute job showing people the pros and cons of buying or not buying. Uh, I think the key, though, is uh, being a member of the golf course for a long time is the operation of the course as far as monitoring the people working on the course uh, to have some a semblance of an organization and uh, i think that's the key aspect and now with i guess damon has a lot of experience in re regards to that uh, that to me the biggest thing in running a business was monitoring what people do and making sure they do what they're supposed to be doing. So again, I, I applaud you guys. You've done a great job, and uh, I'm for it. Thank you. This side. Yes. OK, I have another question. Um, what was the amount of the first offer that was made to Robeson for the golf courses that, we knew, that you know, was not presented to the residents? It's it was honestly, I, I don't mean to hurt your feelings or anyone else in here, but that first quote unquote offer is totally irrelevant. The transition negotiation committee was not in place at the time. So quite frankly, we're not even addressing it. And we're not going to talk about it. Ron. Uh, Ron Dutchke, uh, Unit 42, once again, uh, of course, it's not irrelevant to know what the original bid was uh, any more than all the statistics and data that you have husbanded for a year and a half was mu much of it should have been available to us, including the studies that you did on uh, home values, um, which I don't know. I, 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 there's never been any data presented at, even at this meeting and how those home values were concluded. But my comment here is about the purchase price, uh, $2 million. Um, which is going to be paid for out of the reserves. Now, we don't have anything in our CCNRs, I believe, that allows us to borrow from the reserves. And when we pay it back over 20 years, a thousand, what is it? A hundred K. Uh, 
100K a year. 100,000 dollars a year. Well, that doesn't make it whole because the um, present value of, uh, two, uh, of a $2 million withdrawal doesn't get made up by 20 years worth of payments. So we have to up that, and it shouldn't be over 20 years. Why? 20 years is kind of a made up number, kind of to ease the burden uh, that you're suggesting that the community bear. Uh, so um, the, the $2 million number uh, compared to the $1 million that Oro Valley paid uh, for a lot more, compared to the zero, I think, that Skyline paid uh, to get their golf course, um, strikes me as being something that you would have to justify. And the fact that Robeson says he wouldn't sell it for less, that it suggests that we have no bargaining power. Our bargaining power is to say no and see what happens. Thank you, Ron, and you have the opportunity to do that through your vote. Uh -oh. <laughs> By the way, I'd like to make one comment, not a question, it's a comment. We did go to our legal uh, representations, our attorneys, and we can legally borrow from our reserves. And we have that in writing. Thank you, sir. Tom Ambler, Unit 32, Lot 78. We just discussed that we had approximately 350 paid annual memberships. What was that number at the beginning of the uh, financial analysis period of 2011? I don't remember the actual number, but it was probably somewhere around four and a quarter to 450. Really? I had heard something substantially higher than that, which is why I asked. Okay, thank you. Yes. Jim Prager, Unit 46. Kind of a feed off that last question or comment. If the revenue stream that was projected is primarily going to come from additional golfers and memberships with from new residents, um, if the trend, or maybe the question is, what is the trend in terms of golfers today? What, what has our membership gone from plus or minus over the last six years? what percent of our residents actually use the courses versus HOA-1. And if I'm not mistaken, golf as a trend is a decreasing number. So what model have we used that would tell us that we're going to be able to actually increase memberships? Where did that model come from? Okay, thank you. We do have an analysis that was done. Um, Let's go back to the 2015 um, survey that was part of developing our strategic plan. We asked the question about who uses the golf courses because um, it's really hard to get the numbers otherwise. You get things, you get memberships, and then you've got cards, and then you've got people like me who pay, and then you've got people who pay, but they use golf now. And so it's really, really hard to tell how many of our, mem our residents use a golf course. So we asked. And the answer was about 36% of our, our, our residents golf at some point on our golf courses. We also asked them about, um, did they also golf at HOA 1? And I don't remember the percentage, but there was a small percentage who said part of the time, and some of them all of the time, uh, golfed at HOA 1. So we know we have more than those 60 annual members who migrated. We have other people who pay cash, who have membership cards, who, who are occasional golfers. But about 36% of our residents report to us that they are golfers. To the national trend, you are correct. Nationally, the trend has been going down. Where'd you go? You sit back down? Lost you. Okay. Yes, the national trend is, uh, you are correct with the national trend. There is a trend both in play and uh, there's been a decrease in the number, number of closings. I think there's been an increase in places like Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, kind of harsh up there on that environment. But we are not concerned about the national trend. We're concerned about the two golf courses that we're looking at here. And those trend lines, number of rounds played, have stabilized 16, for 15, 16, and there has been a slight uptick in the first quarter of 17. This will be in the information that we're providing on the website, and you will, see, you will be able to see that. 
So there's a marketing plan in existence or will be a model that you were modeling off of that will show how we're going to increase these memberships. Yes, yes, the marketing report is online as well as the financials associated with those increased revenues. It's online right now. And the model for this marketing? Plan? Yes. It's there. From where? Just tell me. Uh, but Borders modeled it out for us and then we modified it. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go back to my first question about Mountain View Golf Course. Can it be only used as a golf course? And this question is because uh, about a week or so ago, I was talking to a neighbor who had talked to Vince, and um, she indicated that she doesn't look at it as a golf course. She looks at it as land. And so if we own it, we own that land. And it can be used for other things, um, like pickleball courses, uh, a, a park, outdoor recreation, et cetera. And so do we have it in writing that it can only be used as a golf course? Uh, currently, we do have it in writing that it can only be used at a golf course, but I want you to refer, in addition to that, I would like you to take a look at the letter of intent, paragraph 7, which talks about restrictions and the usage for the golf courses, and that covers your, answers com that covers your answer completely. We intend to be, our, our golf courses will be our golf courses. The reality of it is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, we have no clue what the trend's going to be and uh, what, what's going to happen to our community. So we have to put in these legal agreements uh, um, enforceable restrictions by the county that we can enforce for uh, up to 10 years according to their county uh, rules and regulations indeed and according to Arizona regulatory statute. So we're very confident that this is not going to change. And uh, really, it's not. OK. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm Dave Malizia from Unit 48. I have a little background in golf, and I moved here to play golf, and I don't have any problem with the acquisition. I wondered, though, in budgeting, you proposed a lot of capital expenditures, but has there been any discussion as to some expenditures uh, to make improvements in certain areas of the golf courses that I think lack playability? And when you talk about playability, just as in Laurel Valley, where residents got older and they were losing golfers, I think sometimes you can do things to keep older people to continue to play. And I wondered if that item is discussed, the golf courses themselves. It's been discussed about uh, having forward tees uh, to shorten the course, uh, where you start at maybe the 200-yard marker with tees. And um, Robeson had discussed that, but Robeson is not very good at following through on that type of thing. And what we would hope is when we get our management in place, that if there's a need to do that, they would go out into the community and talk to to uh, elderly people that may still have an interest in playing golf but can't play any of the tees we currently have and that they could move forward and do that. Well, I'm, I'm also talking about little things. Right. Take uh, the two uh, practice putting greens at both courses. They're billy goat hills. Go to any professional tournament, you'll see a practice tee where it's fairly flat. You're out there to find the speed of the greens, etc. And maybe those are reasons why some people the guy will take his wife out and the first thing they'll start is, well, let's go putt and they'll go put on that putting green that, you know, she's going to get frustrated. Or he's going to get frustrated and they're not interested in playing golf. And little things like that can help improve getting golfers to our course. Totally concur. And what um, there's that $560,000 in the first year that a part of that money is about 100, well, I can't remember right now exactly what the figure is, mm -hmm. but part of that money is going to be dedicated to what we're calling up startup cost, which means doing exactly what you say. And Damon could probably go into a little more detail about some of the issues that he has discovered along with the other team to say, this is unacceptable. Cracked, cracked uh, uh, golf cart paths, uh, overgrown uh, 
uh, bad markers, bad painting, bad, you, you, all these different things. So we need to improve the amenity itself, the course itself. Dan, can you talk to just a couple yeah, ideas? Yeah, real quick. There is, there is extra money built in um, throughout the five years, but especially in the first two years, for additional herbicides, fertilizers, what we need to, to get the turf back to where I would personally like to see it. And then just the attention to detail is the easy part. Uh, you know, edging cart paths, edging bunkers on a regular basis, making it aesthetically appealing when you step on the golf course, and that, that creates perceived value in itself. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is Mike Buckley, uh, Unit 36, Lot 36. I have two quick comments and then a question. The first thing is I hate to disparage the current golf management, but I know that they have done a lot to push people away from playing as much golf as uh, people did previously at HOA 2 courses. I'm one of them. I used to be an annual, but I'm not anymore, and that's because of current golf management. The second question is, or the comment is, uh, use of the reserve fund. I, I'm a little concerned to see that one-third of our reserve fund that we have been uh, allocating for roads and other needed uh, repairs on buildings in uh, the HOA uh, are going to immediately be used to be spent on the golf course. And I understand that eventually it will be repaid, which is good, but I hate to see one-third of that amount being used immediately at, at transition, basically. Here is my question. I'm not sure I understood what you were talking about with the use of the capital improvement fund, talking about that it wouldn't be used for the golf course, except if you were building a, a brand new pro shop, it sounded like that was coming from the capital improvement fund. Uh, can you just explain that? And will you also use funds from the capital improvement fund to build the six to eight new pickleball courts that you've talked about as a possible uh, addition to uh, the HOA. And, and also, uh, will you uh, reopen? I am not a pickleball player, but I still think it's an important amenity to the community. Will you reopen the pickleball courts that were previously used at the preserve after transition? Thank you. Okay, Mike. Mike, please stay here because you asked three questions and I wasn't writing fast enough. So let's, what was that first question? Okay. Use of the capital improvement fund. Okay, yeah, that one, that one I can answer. Then I'm going to throw the others over there. What I was trying to say with the capital improvement fund is, is twofold. First of all, those monies come in over a year's period of time. And the first part of that is last year the capital improvement fund started in July. And when that started, the board at that time said that 40%, no, we did a half and half last year that whatever came in from July 1 through December 31st, 50% of that would stay in the capital improvement fund and 50% would go into reserves. What that equated to is that at the end of 2016, there was $66,000 put into capital improvement fund staying there and $66,000 went into reserves. What we said was for fiscal year 2017, the year we're currently in, the board approved that whatever funds come in via the CIF in 2017, that 40% of that money would stay in the capital improvement fund account and 60% would go into reserves. At the end of this year, the capital improvement fund, the one where we haven't already devoted the money to reserves, has enough money in it, will have enough money in it to pay for that small pro shop and then still have more and then still have money in it. So that's the first thing I was trying to clarify with regard to what we're doing with capital improvement funds. The other area that I think um, there may have been confusion about is when we talked about the impact to homeowners with regard to dues and what it could do for us or, or what they could be was these estimates are based on this draft five-year plan that we have right now that's projecting out what they believe dues could increase to be. However, 
that dues increase is not looking at all at the impacts of the capital improvement fund. So that, what I'm trying to say there is that each year, as we move forward, the board will say, in this given year, we're putting this percentage, leaving it out of the fund, or leaving it in the fund, and we're putting this much in reserves. For every dollar of that amount that goes into reserves, that helps to offset the amount that our dues are, because it's our dues that normally fund the reserves. And now, what was your second question? Will you also use capital improvement fund money to build the pickleball courts, the six to eight additional pickleball courts that you say will be available with the extra land we're getting? Pickleball courts, pickleball by itself has been self-sustaining by the membership for like the built the courts, current courts at Ridgeview. Uh, it's not been determined yet as to who will pay how much. I do know there's a significant pickleball reserve in anticipation of maybe building more courts, but the amount between the pickleball association and the in the uh, the, the unit, the, our association, is is really to be negotiated or be discussed. It's not been discussed at all. This is new news to the pickleball people at this point in time. You also mentioned something about preserve courts. There were courts up at the preserve that were used for pickleball. They've been shut down basically. Well, there are, no. no, no, except no. If you use the quiet ball. Um, you can still use it, but otherwise you can't play pickleball up there using the normal ball. And you know, the, and maybe this is urban legend too, but supposedly that was all done because a person said, I will not buy that lot unless you force the pickleball players to use the quiet ball. So uh, like I say, I don't play pickleball. I only know that these rumors yes, that sir. I hear yeah. around Saddlebrook. Well, I do play pickleball and I play it preserve. Okay. Um, right now, there's one tennis court that has been converted to three pickleball courts at the preserve. They have said they do not want to have the, a hard ball up there, so we use a soft ball. It's a quieter ball. And there has been discussions off and on with Robinson about how long we're going to be able to play. And it, it, at one point, it's going to be this year they stop us playing. But it's been, I think it's, it's working well for everybody, so no one's going to change at this point in time. Post-transition, I don't know. But the, the pickleball courts that preserve are in use right now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir. Hey, I'm Doug Sifford, Unit 49, Lot 30. Um, I'm pleased that you guys were working towards uh, shifting the preserve over to uh, Fluent and negotiating with Robeson to get the, uh, the utility company to put in the pipeline. However, not trusting Robeson, I'm curious what assurances or agreements we have to prevent us from having the most expensive affluent in the state of Arizona. Water guys. In, the, in the letter of intent, uh, there's a clause that refers to that. Actually, there's two, two areas. Uh, the first area, uh, they have up to six months. Well, first of all, they, they said they told us it's going to take about six months to build the pipeline. One is already there. We don't know where this new one is going to be routed, but about six months to, to put it in. And so in our letter of intent, it states that they have six months following the, the signage of the purchase agreement to have that pipeline installed. I am sure that if it's a yes vote, we'll begin encouraging them to begin building that pipeline ASAP. The second piece of, of this is that if they don't complete it in six months, when we uh, reach the final purchase agreement, there will be a clause in there representing some type of penalty to RCI or to the Saddlebrook Utility or whatever they're called. Yeah. So we, we have we have thought about that and it is addressed. You guys, uh, want, you guys want to talk about the rate increase and how they oh, work that? Okay. Uh, as far as the uh, and water rates, uh, currently, if you're a Ridgeview customer because you're up in the preserve, uh, you're paying 85 cents per thousand gallons of water for the golf course. Uh, the effluent is 58 cents per thousands of gallons. So it's considerably, considerably different. Uh, if uh, you are a Lago de Loro, uh, you're paying 85 cents per thousand gallons of water. Uh, nothing can stop Robeson from going to the Arizona Corporation Commission and requesting a rate increase. Every utility company does it all the time. Um, 
we have an opportunity, if, if he so chooses to do that, we have an opportunity to attend those hearings and provide input. And should the ACC rule in the favor of our, uh, the Saddlebrook Water Company, um, we can appeal that process. Now, during the hearings, the ACC members look at revenue and they look at uh, expenses. And so they, they try to make a, uh, you know, a, a fair, a fair judgment about a rate increase. But uh, the water company cannot willy-nilly just increase the rates. So will the 700000 cost to put the pipeline in get floated to us through increased rates through that board? It, it certainly could, yes. But um, the discussion has been had both with um, our water attorneys and um, uh, Rick's best friend at the Kagert offices also. And basically what they what they said was, and it's true, this is a business and a business is entitled to make a profit or they won't be in business. However, the total cost of what it takes expenses versus revenues associated with a utility like this, $700,000 gets to be almost inconsequential when it comes to factoring it in for a rate increase. They are entitled to make a profit, but what we have heard is that as a public utility, they aren't entitled to break the back of their customers. And that's kind of what the ACC is about. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim Grant, 48, uh, Unit 48, Lot 72. Uh, the lots at the preserve, what happens with the money for them when they do sell it? When, if we buy that golf course? There's all kinds of lots. In there. The lots are independent of the golf course. Um, well, would, they're on the golf course, a lot of lots. No, well, they're, yes, they're, but they're planted as neighborhood as, as residential lots. They're so, they're not within the survey meets and bounds of the golf so course. So Robeson would keep those? Yes. Yes. And then he can come in and build on them in the meantime? Oh, yes. 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 Okay. Actually, we would encourage him to do that because we get some money out of that, too. Yes. Hi. Uh, Carol Poole again, Unit 15, Lot 123. Um, I have a question about the annual dues that increase that you're projecting at 2.8 percent per year period for all the annual dues i've been here nine years and when i looked back at the numbers it seemed to me that the annual dues increased on an average of four percent a year so i'd like to know how you got to 2.8 percent including the golf course which we haven't been paying for Actually, the numbers came out to be 5.6% on the dues increase across the board as we looked back on it, with the exception of last year, which was zero increase in dues. Uh, in 2018, uh, if we take base using the base yield at $1,980, there's a 3.03% increase, which brings it up, of course, to 240. And then it decreases 2.91, 2.83, 2.75, 2.67, all the way out to 2022. The average of that is 2.838%. Now, I want to emphasize something. This is a trend. This is part of the five-year plan. We don't know if that's actually going to be that high. That is a worst-case scenario, as, as uh, Joyce has already talked about. Well, how does you even get from the five-something percent to three percent? I mean, that's I, I, a big reduction. Well, it is. And we've done, uh, if you take a look at the last two years of our financials, we've done a, a, from a management standpoint, we've done an excellent job of staying on budget. I think I forget the percentage, but it was 0 0.0009 percent uh, of within budget for last year. So the management side of this that has created a great deal of confidence in our budget planning process, and quite frankly, um, that gives us a lot of uh, good data for the next five-year plan. Vince, I, I have a couple of areas that I can address for you, Carol. First of all, when you go back and look at those higher percentages of increases in dues, there were several factors. Um, initially, RCI, when we first bought, when they were still involved, they kept our dues artificially low in order to get us to purchase. I'm shocked so when to hear the, that. Pardon? I'm shocked to hear that. I know. We all were. Um, but I kind of figured it out when I heard what the dues were, and I realized that the, the uh, fitness facility I used where I came from 
I actually paid more for that annually than I was for the annual dues. Okay, but so what, so what has happened? Why did we have those increases? First of all, like I said, it, they were artificially deflated. So we had to start to recover from that. The other thing that happened during those years that you're describing was we were allowed to start a reserve fund. The HOA could not do that for a number of years. So of course that kind of bumped the dues up too because now not only were we paying for the operational expenses, now we were starting to take an additional portion of dues to put into the reserves. What's happened I think now is that we've kind of stabilized. We no longer have to we no longer have to raise the dues to the amount we used to because we're kind of in line now with regard to operational costs and we kind of have it figured out with regard to um, the reserves, and that's why I think you're seeing it um, being less. If, if I can add, Trace, one major thing that that helps us here is when we do transition, the four percent um, administration fee to Ropeson goes away. A portion, a portion of their fees went away this year to the tune of eighty thousand dollars. The rest is three hundred sixty-four thousand dollars budgeted for this year. So you're looking at roughly four hundred fifty thousand dollars that will disappear when we transition. We will have to spend about half that to, to backfill some of those roles, uh, some of the accounting roles, the human resources roles. But there's a significant savings of 150 to 200 thousand dollars per year going forward, just because we won't have to pay those administrative fees. And the other thing I think of something Vince was mentioned: we also have um, more homes closing. More homes closing means there's more more dues coming in. Yes. Okay. From what I understand of the presentation. If we buy the golf courses, then we're in charge of uh, the current people or people we hire will manage and maintain those golf courses, if I understand the presentation correctly. Yes. yes. Have, what companies have you contacted? There are companies in the United States that will do this. Have you contacted any of those companies to find out what they would offer? Yes. Um, Manny's going to take the question. Um, what I will tell you, though, before he starts, is that we did contact Troon. He's going to discuss that with you. The Troon proposal is not on the website. If you want to take a close look at it, it will be available in the admin office, but you must sign a non-disclosure agreement. That was the condition upon which Troon would allow our members to look at it. From their perspective, they don't want that information falling into the hands of their competitors. So I just want you to know it's available, and I'll let Manny take the actual question. Yeah, we looked at uh, Troon, and uh, Troon will only supply a list of people you should, they think you should hire. They'll come out occasionally and check your soils, take soil samples and that. And uh, they're charging about uh, a six-figure number. And I can't reveal that to you. But uh, here's a, it's a, averaging around the country on other companies about $150,000 a year. And then uh, we talked about uh, Arnold Palmer up there at the uh, Skyline Golf Course. They're getting $600,000 a year from the residents. Now, I could do better. I think I think we as a community do better than that. And we do I think we can do at least as well as Troon will. And all they offer really other than their services is they said, well, because of our name, we'll get you things cheaper than that because we buy in bulk. Well, we don't seem to have that problem now because we're not uh, you can go to Vans, you can go to any kind of place around here and do the same thing. So, no, we're not we, We're not going to use Troon, and that's probably why they won't let us reveal their numbers or their thing, because they don't want to get it out of what they actually cost. But um, I know Vail was under Troon, the golf course down there, and that wasn't too good. And uh, But Troon out there at, uh, oh, by Florence? No, 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 Florence. Huh? Um, yeah. yeah, and El Conquistador wasn't, didn't turn out too well either for him. Post and View was the one I was thinking about up by Florence. 
But Jess, you can come in and take a look at this, and we'll have arrangements for either myself or Mike Brenny to be there with you. Thank you, sir. Hi, uh, Joe Cachella, Unit 48, uh, Lot 135. I'd like to thank you for the excellent effort you guys have put into this. It's very appreciated. And uh, with respect to the offsets and uh, how that will $150,000 will accrue to us if we purchase, I, said, I think it's simply brilliant. Uh, I do have a question on on water, though, uh, as it's uh, one of our going to be one of our largest expenses and unknowns. So, on this five or six years of data you have from RCI, do they? I, I'm interested in knowing what they paid every year in water costs and what the percent of change was per year. And um, with respect, to, I guess it's Kegar. Uh, maybe in the last six or ten years, what types of uh, rate increases have they allocated? So, n not that it's a negative, but so that I can get a grasp on uh, if we get in a really bad drought situation, which which kind of took care of itself somewhat last year, what we could expect in terms of change in magnitude of numbers. Thank you. Um, it, it's very hard to estimate the Kagert fees. Uh, when they started back in 1995, 1996, their fee for um, was $52 an acre foot for, for potable water used. Um, this year on, our ta on the tax bill that'll be coming, it's $620 an acre foot. And so it's been escalating rather dramatically the last 10 years and, and part of it is because they are charged with making sure that we have 100 years of water. And the way Arizona is designated, it, they, they do it into three um, management areas. And so we're, we are in the um, tu Tucson, yeah, the Tucson Active Management Area. Saddlebrook is part of that. And so they look at the whole area. They look at the uh, water that's pumped. They estimate the uh, water that comes from other sources, um, such as affluent. Tucson water puts affluent down the Santa Cruz River. They look at water runoff from rain and things like that. And then they build infrastructure to replace water where it's needed and buy water as it's needed to replenish that. that that's their charge. And they will not give you estimates of what water will cost in the future. There is one thing, though, that I'd like to add to that, too, that might help you. If you were to look at the financials, the historical financials of RCI, we're not putting them on the website per their request, but they are available in our administration office for you to look at. So what you would try and look at with regard to trying to figure out some of the K-Guard feed jumps is... Um, you'd have to go to the line item called uh, property taxes. However, there's another glitch there. Once again, we try and explain it a little bit in the white paper. When Mr. Robeson, when Saddlebrook Development Company developed the preserve, and he went forward with his plans for the preserve, and he had to prove that there was enough water in his current operations or the Saddlebrook utilities to, to take care of it, well, when a developer does this for any of these communities, he gets, at the time it's approved, a certain number of water credits. He can use those water credits on an annual basis to offset his Kagerd fees. He can't use it at 100%. He can't use it at a certain amount. So what he's done over the years, but, you know, as he uses those credits, they go away. Then there's no more credits. So what has happened is, over the years, when the rates weren't so bad, he only used what percentage of how many credits a year? Like I don't know. Recently, he was at 40, and he's up to 60 now. Now he's using 60% of his remaining credits per year because the fees are getting higher. So what's going to happen is if you go back and you look at those property taxes, it's not really going to give you an accurate money, an accurate idea of what it's going to, of what the impact is to us. 
because quite frankly, we don't have water credits. We wouldn't have anything to offset that. But for instance, in 16, he was able to cut his KGARD fees in half, literally in half, by using 50% credits to do that. And then could I just follow up quickly on uh, effluent? So the preserve uses 100% effluent, is that correct? Or, no, it or will, is it not that, now. Or it is will. it that they have a deficit and we need to supplement? Yeah, uh, yes, because in the summertime when we need water the most, there's the fewer, fewest number of people here flushing toilets. Yeah. Right. We, so, we yes. Will, we will not have enough effluent to offset completely, so we will still be having Kaggard fees uh, imposed on us, but it'll be much less, 150000 less than what it would have been. To, to give you an idea, uh, last year the preserve used a total of 372 acre feet. Now, an acre foot, oh, I'm sorry, Mountain View, uh, 4, 438 for the preserve. And an acre foot equates to 325, 851 gallons. Okay, so we know how much water was used. We know how much of that was effluent. We know how much of that was potable water for, for the last five years. So we do have those figures. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, Skip Anthony, uh, Unit 49, Lot 32. Um, was the uh, My question is about the offer number. Was it based on the numbers of equipment that you guys did um, when you did your study? Because uh, the equipment has been moved around significantly and purchases have been made and and taken to the ranch. So is the offer based on your original head count or cart number count or the current count? We are basing it on the, on the equipment sheets that we had when the equipment was first evaluated by Borders Golf. Yeah, we, we have all the serial numbers that, uh, on all the equipment from Mountain View. And the uh, boarders were supposed to get them up at the ranch, or up at the preserve, and uh, they didn't do that. So, and most of it we thought we could salvage until we got up there. And the best they could use it for is probably a boat anchor for most of that stuff. It's all obsolete. It's over 10 years old. They got the poor mechanic up there trying to keep that thing together. Instead of cutting grass, it just pulls it out of the ground. And that's not a good position to be in. The new equipment that we are getting or will get is uh, new, it's modern, it's smaller, it's faster, it's more fuel efficient, burns diesel, less pollutant in the air, quieter so you can sleep if you're on a golf course. <laughs> and uh, it's just better. But it's about the cart numbers, though, like cart number one through 20, one through 12 at Mountain View mm -hmm. is on loan from the ranch. So that will mean if he takes those back up to the ranch, to can, he'll have carts one through 76 at the ranch. At the preserve and Mountain View, we will have one through 74, meaning we only have half the number of carts that he has at the ranch. Currently, that's not going to be enough to sustain the December, January, February, March uh, busy season. We, we turn the carts all over any given day. We turn the carts over, uh, and I have to clean the carts extra to get the number of people out on the course. There's only four, there's less than 40 carts per, um, per, per course. course. Yeah. That's not enough. No. Okay, thank you. And uh, like I said, though, we are using the numbers that are in the in the uh, that were done when when the courses courts were evaluated. If that's it, I want to thank you all for your time.